Howdy there folks, Nasc here. Recently I took part in a collaboration video hosted by Tyler Preston, responding to a video from PragerU YouTube channel titled, If There Is No God, Murder Isn't Wrong. The original video is such a clusterfuck of nonsense, as popular opinion seems to also suggest, and the collaboration was enjoyable to take part in. It was a nice little success. So Tyler got a hold of me and did me the real honor of asking me to do a full response to another PragerU video this time as a guest video for his channel. Partaking in the prior collaboration was enjoyable, and PragerU seems to offer up some fantastically odd content. So, of course, I couldn't possibly say no. And I'd like to really thank Tyler for giving me this opportunity, and I certainly hope that you all enjoy it. But anyways, let's get started here, shall we? Alright, Prager. What the hell have you got for me today? Are humans more valuable than animals? Oh, for Christ's fucking sake. Before we get to the video, I just want to address the question posted in the video's description. If you saw your dog and a stranger both drowning in the ocean, which would you save first? Obviously, I'd save my dog first, you fucking morons. The dog, I have a deep personal connection to, and they are a part of my family. I have a vested interest, especially emotionally, into saving my dog. The stranger, though? Sure, if it was just them drowning, I'd help them as fast as I can, that's just the humane thing to do. You introduce my goddamn dog into the mix, though, and you force me to make a decision based on bias and self-interest. It's not necessarily a bad question, but it doesn't really help tackle the issue, does it? Okay, now we can get to the video. Here we go, I guess. Are you more valuable than a dog? Or a cat? Or, for that matter, a tree? Of course I am. If by valuable you mean how much all of my organs and body parts will fetch on the black market. If we're referring to non-monetary definitions of value, then I'd say, no. I'm incapable of the love, comfort, and companionship of a dog or a cat, and neither do I produce much needed oxygen for my fellow man and reduce greenhouse gases. I mean, I can make greenhouse gases. Ah, uh, methane. One of the biggest differences between Judeo-Christian values and secular values concerns this very issue, the worth of the human being. According to the Judeo-Christian value system, human beings are infinitely valuable. Probably because Judeo-Christian values promote a delusional and inflated sense of self-worth rather than recognizing human beings as exactly what they are, animals. Pardon us for holding all life to the same standard and navigating that standard through our daily lives and our expression of civilization. Rather than assuming we're infinitely better than every other form of life and inflating our egos to grand and immeasurable levels, not to mention using it as an outright excuse to rape the planet and kill off species faster than any natural period throughout history in complete and abject disregard of the effects. Because, you know, they're just animals. They don't get to go to heaven. On the other hand, secular humanism devalues the worth of humans. As ironic as it may sound, the God-based Judeo-Christian value system renders humans infinitely more valuable than any humanistic value system. The reason is simple. If there is no God, human beings are only material beings, and therefore not worth anything beyond the matter of which they are composed. We're all just stardust, my dude. Yes, science! But wait, is that the roaring sound of a baseless, unproven, and egotistical argument that cometh this way? But in the Judeo-Christian system, human beings are created in the image of God, meaning that human life is sacred. In other words, we are either created in the image of carbon atoms, and therefore not worth much more than carbon, or we are created in the image of God, and therefore infinitely valuable. Called it. Let's talk about that a bit, shall we? If we are created in the image of God, an unproven, unsubstantiated, mysterious being that exists outside of both time and space, then human life is somehow of infinite value. On the other hand, if we are but created from matter in an amazingly complex and fantastic manner, made of measurable physical things, made of carbon and iron and oxygen and so on and so forth. We aren't really valuable at all for that. The very matter which the universe itself is made from. 
the very matter by which all living things, both on this earth and likely throughout the universe, are made from with spectacular and unimaginable rarity. What makes us who we are through countless billions of years of matter moving through a vast and chaotic cosmos, whereby the miracle of life itself, in all its rarity, complexity, and possibilities, happens to form on this little blue rock of ours. To grow, to evolve, to change, to adapt, to improve over so many millions of years into the vast array of life we see, and allowed us to become what we are today. That kind of rarity, that kind of chance, that kind of occurrence, a miracle in and of itself in many ways is not valuable. To place so little value on the very matter that allowed us to come into being, and which the entirety of the universe itself is made, this has so little value. Maybe it's just me, Dennis, but personally, I have a hard time finding more value in an omnipotent being just thinking us into existence as he lazily plays with his ant farm of a universe, rather than the value of the astronomical odds against which our little world formed the way it did in just the right place in the solar system, and just the right events occurred to allow life itself to form from the chaos of a harsh and violent cosmos, and survive as long as it has to give us the abundance of life in all its complexities and forms. That's the true miracle, if you ask me. And a miracle of nature is worth far more than the momentary thought of an almighty being. Our secular post-Judeo-Christian society has rendered human beings less significant than at any time in Western history. Or more significant, depending on the perspective. Just because we don't necessarily consider ourselves to be made in God's image doesn't devalue us as human beings. If anything, it removes the dogmatic limitations on our value and allows us to flourish beyond our prior considerations. First, the secular denial that human beings are created in God's image has led to humans increasingly being equated with animals. Because we are animals, and every single piece of evidence available proves it. Last I checked, no one has proven that we are quote-unquote made in God's image. That's why, over the course of 30 years of asking high school and college students if they would first try to save their dog or a stranger, two-thirds have always voted against the person. They either don't know what they would do, or they actually vote for the dog. And many adults now vote similarly. Probably because, as explained previously, we have far greater incentive to save our dog rather than a stranger. We have an inherent desire to save that which we have formed a powerful, even familial bond. A stranger, we don't know. We don't know who they are, what they're like, what they think, what they've done. Nothing. We have neither a vested interest nor an inherent obligation to save a stranger. Hell, as long as I have you here, allow me to pose a question. What if the stranger you save is a serial killer, a rapist, a child molester, a womanizer, an abuser? If you'd prefer to save someone like that over your dog, a living, breathing, feeling being with whom you have a bond, a life with, and love for, then I'd seriously question your own moral position. But go on, Dennis. I've answered why. Now give us your perspective. Why? There are two reasons. One is that, with the denial of the authority of higher values, such as religious teachings, people increasingly make moral decisions on the basis of how they feel. And since just about everybody feels more for their dog than for a stranger, many people simply choose the dog. So you'd prefer we let our dogs drown in order to save a stranger because you believe that human life is inherently more valuable? Belief is based entirely on feelings in regards to a matter that cannot be reasonably measured. You feel that God is real, and so you believe in him. You feel that human life is of more value, and so you believe it. No different than we feel that all life has inherently the same value, but some lives are worth more to us personally by dint of our experiences, and so we believe it. In the minds of most people who don't place human life above all others, but on general parity with all other life, it's reasonable to assume that most of these people would place higher value on that which directly impacts them. Because in the end, how much we value someone or something is inherently subjective. What matters more to me may matter less to you. The other reason is that once you get rid of Judeo-Christian values, there's no reason for elevating human worth 
over that of an animal. If you honestly have so restrictive a perception of the concept of value, then I honestly don't know what to tell you, Dennis. To be unable or unwilling to recognize the value of life itself in the grand scheme of the cosmos says so much not only of your own limitations intellectually, but morally as well. That's why people estranged from Judeo-Christian values, including many Jews and Christians, support programs such as Holocaust on Your Plate. Holocaust on Your Plate is a campaign developed by the animal rights group People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, that teaches that there is no difference between the barbecuing of chickens in America and the burning of Jews in the Holocaust. Dennis, 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 this is PETA you're talking about. These people are psychotic ideologues. Yes, from a certain perspective, the two things are in some way similar. However, PETA's position is very similar to the one you seem to be arguing for. It's an ideological extreme. On one end, there are those, like you, who place human value above all other life. And so the taking of or sacrificing of a non-human life is seen as perfectly well and good. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people like PETA who argue that all life is infinitely valuable, and so the taking of any life is seen as an abomination. A sin, if you will. Extreme positions of any sort, as far as I'm concerned, are never the appropriate position to take, especially in regards to life. Life is all, on a basic level, equally valuable. From there, a variety of factors may be introduced, whereby some life is given more priority and value than another. And this varies wildly across cultures, beliefs, groups, and individuals. I personally argue for a more balanced approach to the issue of life, whereby there is room for considerations and shifting of our perceptions of its value. Why? Because a human and a chicken are of equal worth. So too, in a notorious Tucson, Arizona case, a woman screamed to firefighters that her three babies were in the burning house. Thinking that the woman's children were trapped inside, the firefighters risked their lives to save the woman's three cats. Your point being, this kind of thing occurs all the time. Firefighters and such perform their duties admirably in the rescue of those we cherish, love, and hold dear to our hearts, and bring comfort and meaning to our lives, be it the life of a human or a pet. By their very profession, these people choose to risk their lives for the sake of our own and the lives that matter to us. People who have their pets rescued from crisis find great value in the lives of those animals. How we value life is, and always will be, inherently subjective. In reference to the woman with the three cats, I'd have to seriously ask you, if you were one of those firefighters and you refused to rescue her cats simply because they aren't humans, and therefore have little to no value to you personally, would you be comfortable with the pain and anguish it would very likely cause this woman to lose her cats, even knowing full well that you have no idea of who this woman is or what matters to her? If the pain of such a loss were to drive her to suicide, would you regret not saving these animals? If you think these two examples are either just theoretical, the dog stranger question, or extreme, the Tucson mother of cats, here's an issue that is neither theoretical nor extreme. More and more people believe, as PETA does, that even if it would lead to a cure for cancer or AIDS, it would be wrong to experiment on animals. Dennis, there's a vastly distinct difference between how we value life and experimenting on animals. One is our subjective perception of how we individually view the life of another being, dependent upon circumstance and our experiences. The other is essentially the equivalent of torture, cruel and unusual punishment. However, there are arguments to be made one way or another on animal experimentation. A more balanced approach to the issue would be allowing it, but within very stringent and very careful regulation limitations not to be banned outright or just given free reign all willy-nilly. Besides, let's be honest, there's just some things that probably shouldn't be tested on animals. In fact, many animal rights advocates believe that even to save a human life, it would be wrong to kill a pig to obtain a heart valve. These are some of those ideologically extreme viewpoints I mentioned earlier, bro. Come on, I know you're old, but try to keep up with me here. The 20th century showed vividly what happens to human worth 
when Judeo-Christian values are abandoned. Nazi Germany and the various communist regimes all rejected Judeo-Christian values and ended up slaughtering the largest number of people in human history. The communists, I'll give you that one for the most part, but I'll go into more detail later. But it was not simply by rejecting Judeo-Christian faiths that caused these governments and nations to commit the vast atrocities and genocides that they did. It was a matter of power. Even throughout history, Judeo-Christian faiths have committed atrocities and genocides of their own. If you really want to play this game, then you can't just play it with numbers. Organizations of Judeo-Christian faiths, particularly the Roman Catholic Church, were responsible for countless millions of deaths all their own. Throughout history, more people have been killed in the name of God than for any other reason. So I'm confident that the matter of taking lives needlessly isn't the kind of argument you really want to be making, especially in favor of Judeo-Christian faiths. For Nazism, Jews and members of other non-Aryan groups were declared worthless and murdered in the millions. For communists, human worth was determined solely by communist parties which murdered tens of millions of people. Only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could Nazis declare Jews, Slavs, and others subhuman. And only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could communist regimes slaughter those they called class enemies. Individual human life meant nothing. On the contrary, big guy, the Nazis used Judeo-Christian values to justify their genocide. It was by their own interpretation of these values, albeit very twisted interpretations, that they justified to themselves the extermination of the various groups of people they targeted. As for the communists, that all depends. See, I told you I'd get back to it. It could be argued that in a certain respect, communist nations and groups where Judeo-Christian faiths were prominent could have manipulated these values for the benefit of the party and in their justifications of genocide. However, it needs to be clarified that not all nations and regions where communism was prominent were within the sphere of major influence of Judeo-Christian face. Prime examples being Vietnam, North Korea, China, hell, even Cuba, and even many African nations. And so the argument for a rejection of Judeo-Christian values would not apply to a great portion of those killed by or under communist regimes. The lack of Judeo-Christian values does not automatically infer the rejection of them. Meanwhile, human slavery was abolished only in the Judeo-Christian world. Except that this proves nothing in accordance to Judeo-Christian values being the catalyst for the abolition of slavery, particularly when it should be understood that for a very long time, Judeo-Christian faiths promoted slavery via the fact that slavery is a practice promoted in Judeo-Christian texts. If anything, it was secular humanism which gave the greatest rise to the opposition of the practice of slavery, as secular humanism promotes the ideals of basic human rights and freedoms. And of course, for nearly all those who reject Judeo-Christian values, the human fetus is worthless, if its mother deems it so. Likely due to the fact that a fetus is simply a clump of cells until reaching a certain point in its development. Until that point, it has no mind, no consciousness, no awareness, no feeling, no identity, and no capacity or aspects of a living individual. When you can prove a clump of cells a few weeks old displays consciousness, then you can fuss about the abortion issue on relative and legitimate terms. Finally, there is an increasingly vocal part of the environmentalist movement that also denigrates human worth. For these individuals, the human being is not infinitely precious. Trees and rivers and mountains are. Again, as before, these are people on the ideological extremes of the issue of life. I know we're at the end of the video for the most part, Dennis, but that's just no reason to bring up arguments similar to the ones made before, just to be some kind of filler. You can do better than that, Dennis. I know you can. So, are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or a tree? That depends on your value system. I'm Dennis Prager. You're absolutely right. It does depend on one's value system of which there are many. The issue of how we value life is, like most things, a matter of where one falls on the ideological spectrum. Technically speaking, no one knows for certain who is right and who is wrong, or what the right value system is, or what life we should value and to what degree. 
What is certain is that by dint of being on a spectrum, value of life is in and of itself subjective. It's subjective to the society, to the group, to the individual. The best any of us can ever do is argue for our positions and listen to the arguments from others. Some will sway a bit throughout their lives, to whatever degree. It's all subjective regardless. And the best I can ever do is hear your arguments, consider them, and make arguments of my own. Inevitably, it's doubtful we will ever find a definitive answer to the issue of the value of life, but it should always be considered, nonetheless, that no one is definitively right or wrong. Even you, Dennis. Even you.